How are we all doing? Are we good? We're in the, the last session, um, and we'll probably try and get us all out of here a little bit uh, um, ahead of the 1.30. Uh, this really is just an opportunity to, to try and bring things together, a little bit of an opportunity to, to reflect and think about some key takeaways. And so we wanted to ask sort of um, uh, each of our facilitators and moderators from sessions to, to sort of reflect a little bit personally from you know, their session and generally um, some of their ideas uh, and takeaways and then to give you all a chance to, to do exactly the same and then I'll just say a few words uh, uh, from my own reflections at the end and then, and then uh, 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 bring this to, to an end. So, um, you know, I th I th I, I, it was a lot of energy this morning. I thought that was great. I um, really enjoyed this morning. Um, that last panel was, was, was fantastic. We, we heard some real sort of ideas and, 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 you know, and questions and, and challenge. And I think the whole meeting is, is we, we, we've sort of uh, uh, prodded and poked and tried to delve in a little bit more deeply on some of the questions, really thinking about the public-private partnership dimensions to health systems and not just health systems and not just partnerships, but, but that public-private dimension, which I think is, is, is great. So let me, let me go, um, first of all, uh, uh, um, to Bruce, if I may. Um, and, and really, Bruce, just you know, sort of you know, up to five minutes in terms of your you know, key reflections, key takeaways. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. Uh, like I said, uh, and thank you, thank you all. Like I said yesterday during the panel, I think, and it's, it's been a recurring theme for, for the, the week, um, trust came up. And so I did a little uh, play on words here to, to, to s for trust. And, and I think we're, the discussion with the, with the group afterwards, we talked about terminology and, and the definition of terms and the different terms that we use in multilaterals with healthcare providers, with governments, with corporates, academics, and donors and NGOs. And that's just such an important thing as we continue to have this conversation that we realize we don't all speak uh, the same language. Um, I think and it helps us to build trust when we, when we know that that terminology and we're talking using the same words. Uh, we heard about relationships being the, the, the basis for, for making partnerships work as well. And those relationships come from uh, understanding ourself, our motivations, uh, actually knowing our own motivations, and making them known to those with whom we're working. Uh, it was a little bit harder to come up with an S, but I, I uh, scoping, um, and scoping the local priorities. So we've talked about what are our needs potentially as donors or um, uh, or the government or the, uh, the corporation or the, the academic institution, but also the community needs, the local community, um, and how do we scope those, and how do we help build the capacity so they, they make their own, um, they meet their own needs eventually. And then finally, I'm not sure this came up as much, um, but again, to come up with words that spelled trust, transparency, and it's come up a time and time again that more than just accountability that we have to really measure impact and understand um, what's happening uh, once we've created that trust to, to come through with these partnerships. And I think we heard about that from, from different perspectives, from, uh, from Andrew about how you do that with the, the health workforce and, and really having a dual role of, of supporting the health workforce locally in the UK and providing training and benefit uh, uh, internationally. We heard about the coordinating of benefits and how that's important from Christoph in that different partners had different motivations and that they wanted their, um, they wanted their efforts spent in, in certain ways. Uh, and finally, we heard from Clarion um, of course, several great comments, but he talked at the end about the fact that the, we, he flew over and he saw that the faith-based community hospitals and clinics were there. And that was all about trust again. And he brought in the different um, corporate perspectives as compared to some of those other perspectives. 
And finally, my, my, th my perspective on that as I work from the faith-based community um, uh, with the Catholic Health Association and, and working with Catholic healthcare that tries to continue the tradition of those brothers and sisters that went to these foreign countries and lived to become part of those communities and that's how they built that trust because they moved there, they lived among them, they worked with them. Uh, we have, over the last two and a half, three decades, seen the number of those religious communities from the United States change. And healthcare, specifically Catholic healthcare in the United States, has tried to say we're going to replace that by sending people on one week or two week mission trips. Um, and we can't build trust in one week or two week mission trips like the sisters and the brothers that went to these places built trust by living in part of those communities. And it's, it's making that reality known to our own members is, is part of what I'm doing today. Thank you. Great, Bruce. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Joe. Um, I'll try to do uh, both of the panels I was involved in. Uh, there's just so much. I just uh, try to pick out a few things. Um, the, the first thing I wanted to reiterate again is I think we did have a really good um, discussion about um, the sort of health wealth bi-directional arrow and that we don't want to forget that, that health uh, is for many reasons really fundamental to economic and social development and that we, um, we do have um, I think some interesting and promising and exciting opportunities around private sector engagement in the healthcare delivery system but I would say that my other uh, corollary to that is we sort of start stuttering a bit when we get to the area of primary care and, and to broader um, engagement in, in community-based investments, despite the evidence that there are, um, there are opportunities there, uh, big opportunities actually to improve health. And I think Jeanette Vega's comment uh, was really important because coming out of it sort of links to this issue of public payment, private or public provision that if there is uh, public payment and she manages the investment decision, she's in a position to say, um, I can shift financing, I can press down a bit on the balloon of the acute care sector and, uh, and it's real money, I can save and move it somewhere else. Whereas if we're in a highly diversified system, it's very hard to say that and um, legitimately I think um, private sector provider, the alignment I think with the public and private sector begins to break down a bit because uh, people can legitimately say it's not real money, you know, it's either I'm getting it or I'm not getting it. It's not, you know, it's not real money to me to shift something into this uh, primary care preventive space. So that, that sort of constellation of issues I thought um, came over a good bit. Um, I also heard, um, I think the one theme that was more strongly presented during the last two days than we've engaged before is this in issue of engaging the public, uh, in engaging the community, community voice, patient voice, public voice, and that that's got to be part of our thinking uh, strongly. And I think it's been mentioned, but I don't think we have explored the mechanisms by which it could happen. And I think it's an, a really important question for the, uh, the sustainability, especially of the PPPs. We heard that from Mushtaq over and over is that um, we really have to structure in sustainability and capacity building from the beginning. There are ways to do that. There are people who know how to do that and we need to, to consider that. Um, so um, the, I guess the last thing uh, that I think began to emerge uh, from, the, uh, from the discussion that I uh, recall strongly was this issue of really um, moving from uh, not to stop talking about it but engaging in addition in the conversation about the national and subnational levels of partnerships. What do we understand at country level? Um, how can multinational companies uh, stimulate uh, local business through private-private partnerships? How can governments map what's going on there? How can, um, how can those uh, engagements be promoted by the kinds of conversations we're having? And then I think the, I guess the last thing I would say is that um, the, w there needs to be a good enough government uh, in order to make that happen at the local level and there really has not been terribly much attention to the strengthening of government ability and Jeanette said it very articulately. I think uh, we had to learn through mistakes about how to manage, um, how to uh, contract, how to 
sort of engage with all these different partners that are coming at us. And there's got to be a sort of balance, the IT, everything, a balance of, uh, of how do we get uh, strong partners on both sides, or all three, or all four, or all five sides of these partnerships to really make them work. And so um, that's the, the last thing I wanted to, to mention. Well, thank you. It's been a it's been a great two days, great discussions. Um, in thinking about, uh, you know, I certainly uh, could emphasize and reemphasize the points that have already been made by uh, Bruce and Joe. But a, a couple additional things occurred to me um, uh, listening to the discussions. Um, one of them is that. Um, uh, the train may be leaving the station for us uh, as we think about uh, our efforts to uh, develop whatever kind of partnerships they may be for improving health systems or health outcomes. What do I mean by that? Uh, I heard uh, a lot uh, from multiple speakers uh, that the point of care is changing. Um, the point of care is changing to the community, to the household, to the individual. And that's true whether you're in the US or whether you're in Uganda or Bangladesh. It's changing uh, because technology is changing. It's also changing um, the point of ownership of, the pro of, the pro of health systems. Um, and we heard great examples of empowering the community with information um, and with an ability to communicate back um, to, to, to us uh, and to the governments uh, about what their needs are, what their expectations are. And it could be that, um, you know, uh, if we don't, and we heard this from the metrics panel, if we don't put uh, the community and the patients first and their needs first, um, we may be uh, developing programs that are ready, fire, aim, uh, because the community is going to demand uh, more and more and, and control more and more about uh, where these partnerships uh, need, need to go and what, what metrics matter to them. It's also a responsibility on those of us, and we talked about this, who work on these programs to make sure we give accurate and good information back to the community, to the patients, so they can make informed decisions about what their needs are, what their expectations are. And it could be that, you know, the effectiveness, the efficiency, the equity, metrics that we're interested in are going to be defined by the communities for us. Um, so the sooner we get them involved in this process, the better. Um, so that, that came through to me loud and clear. Um, I think the other question that came up uh, is the balance um, between the public and private health systems. Not really, I mean, uh, it's a separate from the public-private partnerships per se, and I think Soji talked about this eloquently uh, earlier, and, and as, as he said, it depends. I mean, I, I was intrigued, you know, as someone who's worked for 36 years in India, I've seen what a difference the, the private sector has made, filling a void uh, for health services that didn't exist 30 years ago. And yet there are places where that has resulted in improved outcomes uh, and health outcomes, and other places where it's resulted in reduced expenditures in the public system and pulling brain drain from the, the public to the private system. And so how do you, you know, with that model, how does that model work? How does that calculus work in other places? Um, um, we, I think that um, increasingly figuring out um, where the benefits of a public health, um, where the benefits of a uh, private health system can be, uh, can be achieved without losing the benefits of the public health system where they're necessary. I think um, it's something that still needs to be sorted out. Um, I think uh, we talked about uh, we need to, as these partnerships are developed uh, to come to a consensus about a shared vision, uh, a consensus about metrics that will define whether we're reaching that the shared vision. Um, and um, but I, I'm still c concerned that we don't yet have a, a clear pathway for, uh, as I think Gina said eloquently yesterday, defining our terms in, in a vocabulary that we all, we, we all know what, we all use the word outcomes and we all talk about um, shared vision, but we still don't yet have the definitions, um, uh, at least a consensus on how they should be defined among all the different stakeholders. I think we can accept the fact 
that everybody has additional secondary uh, reasons. Every partner has other reasons to get involved, whether it's expanding markets or whether it's uh, um, you know, equity or other, other issues that are important or efficiencies. Um, but I think even with defining the outcomes that matter, and maybe the community is going to define that for us as well um, and uh, take it out of our hands, which is probably the appropriate thing. So we, we again, reinforcing what I said at the beginning. And then um, finally, um, uh, it's pretty clear that we need to be continuing to expand the ecosystem of stakeholders involved in this public-private partnership. We've heard many, many times that if you don't have the finance ministry involved in your discussions about health system strengthening, um, it doesn't, uh, doesn't go very far. Uh, it's certainly not very sustainable. Um, and so in addition, I think we need to be expanding our vision for uh, which corporate partners can play a role in strengthening health systems. The obvious one we heard about is the IT industry. Uh, and we heard from Reza about that. He sent me an email last night that said, I forgot to mention that um, the Broadband Commission has done data st studies showing that every 10% increase in mobile coverage results in a 0.6 increase in GDP. Every 10% increase in Internet uh, usage results in a 1.0% increase in GDP. So does that... Depending on, you know, in, in many industries, we would say an increase in GDP doesn't necessarily result in, a, in an increase in health outcomes. It depends on the redistribution. And, but what about, the, what about what we heard about the IT industry today and its direct relevance to health, even at the community level? So it may be that calculus for something like electricity, in, um, roads, and um, and investments in IT infrastructure can connectivity could actually have more direct benefits on health. And I, I think we need to be thinking about, particularly for health systems, how that might be important. So, so thank you, and I uh, enjoyed the discussion very much. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Uh, help, um, Claudia. Thank you all. I'd uh, like to give you all a little gift today in that I'd like to, uh, first, first I'm going to have to drop my uh, normal, how would you say, uh, fun-loving self, but I'd like to take you into a corporate boardroom after all, of, all that you've heard uh, the last couple of days and see how that translates and what you need to know uh, when you're speaking to a corporate person uh, after w with taking off the gloves, giving you insights into how they think and what the expectations were. I did tell you politely yesterday that a corporate medical director is often not s directly involved in the day-to-day -day going ons of the corporation, uh, pro profits, loss, et cetera, et cetera. I also showed you that the deals that go on in the corporation may not reflect on what happens in the medical department, but I do need to make you aware of several things that you should know. First of all, you should know that there is data that you can have access to, and that data may be in any country that they're dealing with in their business plan. It may be in their health impact assessment. The onus is on you to find out if there is data and ask for it. It's often shared with NGOs and other types. That's number one. Number two that I think is very important, every project has a timeline. So when you're talking to a medical director, he knows uh, how long they're going to be in that country and when they'll be decommissioning and what they have to leave for the infrastructure. You need to know that. That's incredibly important because what you're asking for may, may, may be a part of that or may be something else. The third thing you need to know is that when a, when a medical director comes in with you or asks for a new program to come in, they have to be prepared to drop a program. One of the first things they'll ask is, what are you willing to give up if you want to do this? So again, you're, they're always weighing priorities when they talk to you, so you need to, to know that that's part of, uh, th that's one of the, the areas that you, you're impacting when you ask for something. So be prepared uh, to, to make a good case. Uh, the fourth thing I'd like to make you aware of is failure. We talked about failure yesterday and what failure means, but failure isn't enough in the corporate world. It's not your failures, it is also your near misses. What, the questions will be, what did you, what, did you, what almost bad happened? I, I guess the translation in the real world is what keeps you up at night. But in the corporate world, the real question is, what, what, did you al what almost happened? What almost undercut what we were trying to do? You need to be aware of that and that people who are talking to you are thinking about that. The fifth point I'd like to make is that, um, and I think it's very important, 
is that uh, the goal is, in every situation generally, to transfer the corporate or outside power to the local, to the locals. It's incredibly important. The NGOs expect it. Uh, the, the governments expect it. That is the goal. So if you're talking about uh, a permanent role in some aspects, you've got to weigh that into the equation. With what I've learned, what are the takebacks for a corporation? That the due diligence of any interaction in a corporation as part of our health impact assessments, et cetera, et cetera, should be thinking about everyone in this audience being at the table. I mentioned yesterday reflex. That due diligence is the reflex that we should all have in the corporate world to know who our partners should be. But again, uh, you only have so many arrows in your quiver, and when you go to, uh, to shoot, you've got to make sure that you know what power and what capability your corporate partner has and what they're weighing and what they're thinking about when they go to the table for you. And with that, I'll say thank you. And um, you're on, boss. Thank you, Clay. And that was great. Really punchy, <laughs> terrific in that corporate boardroom. Um, so your opportunity, guys, um, for members and others, just uh, if you've got reflections, ideas, takeaways that you'd like to um, you know, put forward, uh, we'd be delighted to hear, hear them. Um, Patrick? Uh, thank you, Simon. This has been uh, excellent. Um, for those of you who were here on Wednesday when we had our closed meeting, I uh, posed a bit of a challenge. Um, some of you know that uh, the IOM has been asked to manage uh, the development of a global health risk framework uh, for dealing with problems uh, such as the Ebola outbreak we've had in West Africa. Um, the Ebola outbreak uh, takes a lot of the principles that um, you've laid out over the last couple of days uh, and uh, highlights where those principles uh, broke down. Uh, in areas of governance, and normally when we think of governance, we think of governments and intergovernmental organizations, uh, but there were a lot of issues around the private sector and how the private sector uh, is governed in the midst of uh, out, not only outbreaks, but preparedness for outbreaks. Uh, there were major issues in the area of finance, uh, major issues in the area of workforce mobilization, information management and surveillance, information technology, uh, medical products, uh, research and development, uh, and mobilization of medical products uh, through logistic systems, um, and the delivery of clinical services. Uh, many elements of the private sector participated in one way or the other uh, in all of these. Um, this uh, project that we're leading, uh, uh, there in, in that project, there'll be an independent commission, as I mentioned, Jeanette Vega is part of it, uh, that will deliver a report to the G7, the G20, uh, the UN, and the World uh, Health uh, Organization Executive Board next January. I guess the question that I have for you is if you're in front of the commissioners today, uh, wearing the hats that you wear in your day job, coming from um, the health industry, coming from uh, the non-health corporate industry, coming from academia, and I wish we had a banker up in front, but coming from the world of, of finance, uh, what would be the, the key message that you would want to give to the commission about the role of public-private partnerships in health systems strengthening so that when something like Ebola happens, uh, the health system doesn't fall apart and that it can be resilient and contain the problem. Uh, so if you wanted to enter into a partnership or your sector wanted to enter into a partnership, uh, what elements of that should the commission uh, consider in formulating its recommendations for system-wide change and strengthening? Great question, Patrick. So let me offer that up and see if anybody wants to um, 
to respond, but I think it's, it's, really, it's, it's, it's pragmatic, it's practical, it's, it's what can we put forward. Clarion? Um, I begin by saying you need a real-time tool, uh, assessment tool, to know what is, to be able to evaluate what is occurring at that particular moment. And that has to be a tool that's transferable uh, to any site and or any illness slash disease you're looking at so that you can put, put all, everything else into play. But you need a tool. So do, does the private sector have those tools? Can the private, does the private sector have a comparative advantage in building those tools? Uh, is it in the business interest of the private sector to have those tools? It's part of your business plan. It's part of your contingency plan. I think the, the, the banker uh, slightly misquoted Mike Tyson, uh, but uh, since I'm from Brooklyn and, I, and we grew up in the same neighborhood, uh, but again, it's all about continually planning. But Mike Tyson said, there's no plan once I hit you. Very good. I, I really not in the right position to answer your question, Patrick, but I, I do think that um, I think there are, just from reflecting on the U.S. emergency response capability, which obviously has been around for a while and um, having seen it from inside government, I mean, I think the, the, the bottom line, at co certainly at country level or international level, is that it seems to me the government always has the ultimate responsibility um, and is holding the bag for whatever response is expected to protect its citizens or to identify health threats or otherwise. And I think that whatever system gets constructed, you know, you can't, the government can't walk, a, a government at a national level or an intergovernmental, you know, entity, a la WHO or others, can't really walk away from that. And I think that diffusing that ultimate, or, or sort of pretending that that ultimate responsibility doesn't sit there would be uh, a mistake. By the same token, I think, um, as I've seen um, the U.S. systems, I mean, essentially the federal government guides each state and each state has to have a plan and then one could make the analogy that, you know, the intergovernmental and then there's the, 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 the you know, the, the country level planning. But I think what we've uncovered in these conversations is exactly the same challenges. It's just uh, the good enough government, the ability to mobilize the resources that are available from the private sector the inclination to do that. And I think part of how you lead, um, presumably, which will be a framework development design group, is to raise, is to bring up these issues that have come up here about the important role the private sector can play, but the need for, the need for these partnerships, the need for incentives, and the need for, I mean, the reality testing of what, you know, the, of having things in place or having things, you know, have to be just in time made available. And obviously there are those are not necessarily skills that governments have. I mean, in the U.S. system, it's really interesting. So uh, <coughs> you get a, um, a fire or a sort of chemical emergency, you call the people in North Carolina. Everybody, that's the team. That's tr they are trained to be national responders, first responders for chemical emergencies in the United States. That decision's been made. And so I think it's an example of how one thinks about, um, and they have to be there, and they have to keep practicing and rehearsing. And does that mean they're the only ones who do? Of course not. But I mean, I think this issue of this infrastructure is ultimately going to have to be an intergovernmental and a governmental spine, and then the issue is opening up these other resources as sort of, in a sense, as uh, uh, Jeff said earlier, you've got to really be sure you, you are open to and able to mobilize these resources and have them ready to act when necessary. Just for back, background, um, for those who are interested in this subject, I believe it was the 4th of June, the World Economic Forum released a major report in South Africa on uh, public-private partnerships uh, uh, and lessons learned in response to the Ebola outbreak. Uh, that I think you can download it. I have a, a copy. Well, um, I'm going to talk about it from a academic public health point of view, and I can give uh, a 30-second summary of what, everything you need to know to get an MPH at Johns Hopkins. It's all about uh, prevent, report, and respond. And the sooner and the better you can do those three things, whatever the disease is, whatever the outbreak is, um, and the, that, that's it. Um, and the, in the health system we heard today and what uh, we talked about earlier, the definition of the health system is changing. It includes now more increasingly the community and the patients themselves, not just the, the health system 
what we typically think about is, is the health system is the health system is what's responding to these emergencies, which is only one piece of it. If, if, you, um, if you can get the community and the patients incentivized uh, to report something and do it early and do it as, as accurately as possible, you, you then have to have a system that can uh, respond to it. But the first step is prevention. The se next step is reporting. So, I mean, we have technologies, we have cell phones everywhere. There are ways to leverage the private sector to improve the, to throw a wider net for reporting things. There are lots of groups working on this. Um, they're looking at things like, you know, assessing Twitter feeds and that sort of thing for evidence of an outbreak of the next SARS, for instance. I mean, they're, they're, but, but I think we have to incentivize the community to be proactive about it and report the next case of Ebola or the next case or a case of polio uh, before the, it spreads to five other kids in the district. Um, the challenge there is, um, is getting the right incentives. I'm, uh, I do a lot of mobile health uh, work and I, was, uh, I re remember a conversation in Uganda about incentivizing Boda Boda drivers. They wanted to incentivize Boda Boda drivers to report accidents and give them minutes on their cell phones. Uh, for reporting accidents so that the, they could respond to the, to the scene. And I, and I asked the, the person talking to me about it, I said, who causes most of the accidents? Well, it's the Boda Boda drivers. So you can incentivize Boda Boda drivers to report accidents, but you might see an increase in accidents. Um, so we need to think a little bit more carefully about, uh, right, about, about that. But we have to incentivize for things like uh, what you're concerned about, Patrick, the emerging infections, we gotta think, we got to incentivize the community. And the private sector has a big role to play there. And then the, Joe's already talked about the health system issues that are required to respond appropriately to that. And I know in some places the community and the company overlap an awful lot more than we're used to thinking about, I think, in the United States. Clarion is referred to inside and outside the fence. And, uh, uh, you know, for example, in Liberia, Firestone County, which I gather is essentially owned by the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company, uh, was very uh, aggressively involved with dealing with Ebola um, uh, clinical care and, and had um, uh, uh, in very valuable uh, information. Uh, one of the members of our commission uh, is drawn from a major mining company, which uh, was heavily affected by this. Another member of our oversight group is the president of Unilever, and Unilever has done a lot of great work around uh, surveillance on plantations it owns and things like that. So they, they, I think sometimes you can think of these companies as uh, uh, in a broader sense than we're used to thinking about here as uh, when we think of them as inside defense operations. Thanks, Patrick. Um, Bob, where do I sign up for the 30-second MPH? I want one of those. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Ambassador Lang, John. Uh, thanks very much, Simon. Uh, this is a very rich discussion, and you asked for some takeaways. Um, uh, a couple of thoughts on that. Uh, last September, the Institute of Medicine Committee on Reinvesting in, or on Investing in Health in Low- and Middle-Income Countries, with which Dr. Ann Peterson and I uh, co-chaired and uh, Rifat and uh, Margaret Crook uh, were, were part of that committee uh, who, who spoke to us in the last couple of days. Uh, and, and our fundamental premise in the report that was released was that uh, the U.S. government and others need to consciously invest in strengthening health systems not, uh, to complement those uh, vertical programs. Um, but I have to say I'm, I'm uh, thinking that one of my takeaways from this is that that there isn't really such conscious investment on the part of public-private partnerships in strengthening broad health systems. Uh, I saw a recent communication from the European Commission that talked about a functioning health system requires vaccines and medicines, but also investment in its structural elements, including financing, human resources, logistics, programming, surveillance, and monitoring, along with the social mobilization and the EU will therefore continue to comprehensively support partner countries to strengthen their health systems. But in, the, um, in a background paper that was prepared for this uh, by Jill Jensen, she said only one out of 90 international health-related public-private partnerships in 2007 focused on improving health systems 
beyond specific diseases. There's limited evidence of PPPs addressing the health system as a whole. And uh, we talked a bit about this earlier that in a sense we're, we're talking about the role of public-private partnerships in strengthening components of a health system. And that then seems to me to put a great onus on the Minister of Health and the other ministers in the government. Ministers of Finance have been mentioned frequently, and, and including the heads of state and government. Uh, maybe it re they really are the Minister of Donor Coordination, as we heard. But uh, if you're going to have these various uh, engagements doing all of the wonderful, innovative things that we've heard today, uh, using mobile technology, et cetera, et cetera, someone in control uh, and, uh, and the Minister of Health only is focused on, uh, on the, the public uh, health component, not the private sector uh, uh, component of health, but still someone has to be looking at where are the gaps and, and ensuring that those gaps are, uh, are addressed in one way or another uh, because um, we, we could have a, a, a great effort with all these public-private partnerships and in the end somebody looks back and says, oh, but nobody really focused on Western Tanzania or whatever, the, uh, or either a region or a sector or whatever. So it's one of my takeaways. Thank you. Thank you, John. Very, very helpful. Any others? Yes, please. Come, Damon. So my takeaway from this uh, meeting is that I had a lot of case studies and experience and insight. And yesterday I was also discussing with can we develop a, and, and, and we invest so much, the government invests so much developing public private partnership and then integrating and for having a public private partnership in healthcare. And but most of them is, is fail. Most of the public private partnership fails. And some of them it could be because of people are not educated enough, or people are not aware about those issues, or people are not aware about the big force they will face. So can we develop a educational program based on the experience and insight? So that any government agency who want to develop, go for public private partnership, for any corporate who want to go for public private partnership, at least to be made aware of those issues to, 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 so that these failures could be avoided in the best interest of the, of the health. Thank you very much. I mean, that's a great question and a really good challenge um, in terms of uh, how are we taking these lessons and experiences, positive and less than positive, and using those to further raise awareness and, and educate. I don't know if, if, if guys on the table here want to, to respond, but that seems like a great challenge um, in, in terms of when you're lecturing at Notre Dame on health governance and, and, and are we talking about the emerging role and the lessons and experiences of uh, private sector involvement and specifically public-private partnerships? And if not, we should be, I guess. Okay, thanks, bear with me. I'm going to move over there just to wrap us up. So um, I wanted to give a couple of, of, of my personal reflections from, from the two days. Um, let me just find my pages uh, here. Uh, first of all, thank you for bursting my bubble again. Uh, it's really important, uh, you know, for, uh, for, for me to, to have these conversations and, and, and listen. Uh, I've learned an awful lot, and I've got a lot to reflect on. Um, I heard on day one, uh, Reza, I think, talked about necessity and desire to make a difference. I'd add to necessity opportunity. I think opportunity is huge here, and there are a lot of people looking for those, uh, and not only the necessity to make that difference, but opportunities to do it. Um, I reiterate what others said uh, um, here just now, but there's this whole uh, idea of relationships, of trust, of honesty, of giving time, uh, of understanding language, of seeking win-wins and, and win of, of, of capturing 
efficiencies and that ability to say what's in it for me or I'm not being stitched up seems to go to the, to the very heart of this. And my hope is that we go to the, uh, to the next forum meeting on shared value. There'll be quite a bit of that that will, will, will also come out. But that was, a, was a, a, a huge dimension of this. I think the second was, was around end user, uh, final customer, ownership, national ownership, country ownership, participation, really, really strong. Um, the ideas about imbalances of power and, 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 and trying to rebalance that, that, that power in relationship uh, and negotiations. And I was looking at Twitter last night, and Uhuru Kenyatta, I think, sent about five tweets out last night saying, we're open for business, we're open for ideas, we want the private sector, you know, please come give us ideas. And not only Kenya, because we're a gateway to East Africa for the whole region, and Kenya wants to do what it can to broker those relationships. So I thought that was great when we saw that leadership coming up. I don't think we talked a lot, or perhaps enough, about leadership at all levels on this. Corporate leadership, community leadership, national leadership, in and how important that is for taking it, taking it forward. Um, we talked a, a little bit, well, we talked a lot about innovation. Uh, we all love to talk about innovation. It just sounds great, it's very sexy. Everybody wants it. Um, there's, there's innovations at all levels. We talked about it not just being technology, but how massively important technology is. I heard Steve Davis talk about pivoting from the what to the how, uh, and I think that's a challenge for, for us going forward. How do we do a lot of this? But bending curves, and John, to your point about um, the, the health system in its entirety and the challenges and difficulties of doing that consciously versus the Montana farm boy uh, uh, pragmatism of saying, well, let's value incrementalism as well. Sometimes we have to do what we can do. That's a trade-off and a challenge that we, that we have to face. I really thought on, on day one they had, we had this, in, this, this great questioning around primary and secondary uh, uh, levels of care and really not yet a clear understanding of the incentives and the drivers and the opportunities for investing there. And, and, and how does that happen? Is, is this is a gap, this is a weakness, this is perhaps a market failure, and what more can we do um, to create the right incentives for that to, to, to happen? Um, uh, Gary talked about this secret formula of um, you know, the bottom of the pyramid becoming the middle of the diamond, and, 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 and I think Jeff talked about, uh, uh, again, sort of quoting Gary, saying many of the skills uh, that you need to develop these public-private partnerships are the very skills you need to create opportunity and shared value and, 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 and uh, investable and returnable uh, uh, and bankable uh, in investment. So I, I thought that's an area that really could use a lot more work. And in our closed session on Wednesday, we actually heard of some really innovative ideas around on that, on that primary level around, I know we didn't like to call it behavior change, but things that can be done that, that, that do in, in, indeed um, uh, um, uh, help with that, that prevention, that primary and secondary level. But I think there's a real um, opportunity for more thinking there. Um, who identifies these gaps and these market failures, uh, and how do we stimulate the identification of those gaps and failures, and how do we broker and stimulate dialogue for those exchanges, I think is something that needs a bit more thought and reflection. I talked about things like the Global Fund and Gavi being areas where we actually do broker, we bring people together and talk, but we're going to need a lot more of that in terms <coughs> of uh, figuring out how we more systematically, methodically, aggressively, uh, 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 and in an accelerated fashion identify some of those, uh, those gaps, weaknesses, market failures. I think affordability for me is, is something that's, that's really huge. Things that we can see that drive, it, I love Clarion's expression of capturing efficiencies, but how do we find those ways in which we broaden coverage, both in terms of population, but also in terms of, 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 of services in a way that is, is affordable. Uh, Clarion, you talked about uh, the corporate sector saying, well, if you're gonna start something, what are you gonna stop? I remember saying to one of my ministers once, he wanted a new initiative. I said, okay, what do you want us to stop doing? And he said, absolutely nothing. You know, <laughs> I want you to do more with less. Um, but I think even in the public sector, we started to get some ideas that we have to make tough choices and we have to make some, some priorities there. But th this affordability thing in the health sector, we, in the global health sector, we've talked about it for some time, more money for health 
but absolutely more health for the money. And I think there are still lots and lots of opportunities for more health and money. And I think we saw from Debbie's presentation today just some real tangible ideas and opportunities for, for doing that. Um, what am I going to do different? Well, I'm going to go away and think about this, but I'm also going to go to the uh, Financing for Development Conference in Addis Ababa. I'll go to the Business Day. I'm going to take much of what I've heard here and repeat it and see what, you know, what, what comes back. So that was, was, was uh, you know, what I'm going to take away from this. It's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, so before adjourning, I need to do some thanks. I want to thank everybody for participating. I want to thank those that have joined us um, by the webcast. Uh, I want to uh, really thank sincerely all our speakers for making time and putting the preparation into this. Uh, I want to thank the co-chair, Kate Bond, who, who, as I said earlier, unfortunately couldn't be here with us, but we're going to touch base with her and let her know what a success it was because of a lot of work she put in. Thanks again to the planning committee, to Joe, to Bruce, to Trevor, and to Bob um, for doing that. And once again, thanks Rachel and thanks uh, uh, Priyanka. Uh, Patrick, your staff, uh, for all the incredible support and guidance they've given us. So with that, guys, I think we're adjourned. Thank you very much indeed. Have a good day.